So good evening, everyone. And I cannot just say Flagstaff this evening. Good evening, good people from the East Coast, the West Coast, and the Midwest. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is another live broadcast uh, brought to you by the Murdoch Community Center. Uh, this is the Black Lived Experience Project where every broadcast we bring or cover a new topic. And uh, this evening's topic is uh, about the Tuskegee experiment and the status of Black health care here in America. We know, or maybe some of us do not know, that medicine um, and health care for those of African descent uh, came from the mother continent, and it's all known as traditional African medicine. And it's always mixed with African spirituality in the care of the mind, body, and spirit. And that was always traditionally using herbs, medicinal plants to heal. And so there was sassafras to help uh, with the immune system to cleanse the blood. And there were plants to help with fever, the pepper boom. Um, and when there was depression, um, you were even buried uh, in the ground, head out, of course, but just the body completely covered in Mother Earth uh, to bring about new life and to help with mental illness. And of course, then enters the colonial rule where traditional medicinal practices were outlawed. And then we had hospitals and clinics. And late 20th century, we sort of come back to um, traditional systems, traditional ways of, of healing. And so tonight we kind of want to just talk about where we are, where we have been with healthcare amongst people of African descent. Our facilitator this evening is Sister Kara House, and she will introduce our panelists uh, as we go along. Sister House. Thank you very much. Uh, our first panelist this evening is Ms. Amber Jones, who will be giving a presentation on the history of the Tuskegee syphilis study. Uh, Ms. Jones is a research associate at the Translational Genomic Research Institute North, where she is responsible for sequencing the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. She has over 10 years of biological research experience that ranges from microbiology, functional morphology, and uh, biomechanics and human molecular genetics. A longtime resident of Flagstaff, Arizona, she enjoys exploring the beautiful Northern Arizona landscape with her family and volunteers with the African American Advisory Council and the Arizona chapter of Postpartum Support International. Welcome, Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones, or Dr. Jones, I'm sorry, if you would uh, unmute your mic, please. Sister Carr, why don't we go ahead with the next uh, segment and then we'll come back to Dr. Green. Uh, so it's actually Amber Jones is the first presenter. I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> Am I on? <laughs> there you well, go. Sorry about that, Ms. Jones. No worries. Um, good evening, everybody. 
Um, let me start my PowerPoint. So I've been asked to talk about the history of the Tuskegee syphilis study, which is one of the most notorious unethical human research studies in the US history. So I would like to start with a quote by um, Alankar Sharma um, from an essay from 2010 entitled, A Diseased Race Ra or Racialized Disease, The Story of the Negro Project of American Social Hygiene Association Against the Backdrop of the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment. They say, Stories from the past can serve as lessons for the future. Stories of oppression, prejudice, and discrimination need to be told as much as those of courage, harmony, and hope. Least we forget, such stories need to be told and retold to keep our collective memories alive, to prevent those who are once relegated to the margins from being eternally relegated to the margins, to remind us of the influence of history on our realities today, and to help us stay conscious and conscientious conscientious as not to repeat similar injustices. So I would like to start with the um, first big character of the story, which is the United States Public Health Service. And I was really curious to know more about them. So they were founded by um, John Adams in 1798 to serve seamen wounded in the quasi war with France. So this was an unofficial sea, sea war between us and France. So in 1837, there were fewer seamen to treat. So they brought in their horizon and started treating a wide range of boatmen. Um, they not only suffered from a number of just on, on site hazards and injuries, they also suffered from communicable diseases like malaria um, and yellow fever and cholera. So, um, and this was also the year that they established a hospital in the Mississippi River Valley. In 1878, we were, um, the US was experiencing the yellow fever epidemic of 1878. So this was the biggest in a long series of yellow fever epidemics in the US that topped, it was recorded um, 120,000 individuals were infected, 20,000 of those died. So this was kind of the last straw for Congress and they passed the Quarantine Act of 1878. And so they repurposed um, the U.S. Public Health Service, which was then in 1798 through 1878, was called the, um, the U.S. Marine Service. They repurposed them and created the United States Public Health Service um, to focus, because they had that background in treating those communicable diseases that we're seeing in the public, they shifted their focus to public health. Um, so... This was also when, so a lot of local places had these quarantine um, facilities. The federal government started acquiring them um, along with the United States Public Health Service. They were all nationalized by 1921. In 1930, between 1930 and 1940, monies were rearranged. So it was a branch of the government or the branch of the military. Well, they, they've um, rearranged money to hire more public um healthcare professionals along with engineers and um, researchers. So that brings us into our time frame for the Tuskegee syphilis study. So what was happening in the US at the time in the 1930s? So Wall Street had Sister Jones, your mic is muted.
Amber, really quickly, you're still muted for us listening. I'm not sure if you have a separate mute on your headset. Did that do it? Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, I'm trying really hard not to touch the button so it doesn't <laughs> happen again. Um, I apologize for that. Um, new headset. Should have tested it out before. <laughs> no problem. Okay, thank you. Um, so Macon County was chosen. It's a part of Tuskegee, Alabama. It was also known as the Black Belt because of really dark, rich soil, but also because of the um, the black sharecroppers that worked that land. So 600 men were chosen for this study. 330, um, 339 men were positive for syphilis, and this uh, these numbers are according to the CDC. Um, and 201 men were negative and used as a control. And to talk about the men a little bit, so these were black sharecroppers. Most of them were poor, or they were poor. A lot of them were illiterate. So when they were approached for this study, they were offered something that they couldn't turn down. So they were offered burial insurance and medical exams. Um, but they also were not told what the study was. All they were told was that this study was going to treat them for quote unquote bad blood. And this was a term that was used for a number of different ailments. So it could be anything from syphilis all the way to um, fatigue. So it wasn't clear what the study was doing. And also um, from what I, what I understand from the readings was that they just, they, they thought they were being treated for something. And I think a lot of them didn't know that they had syphilis. So the um, USPHS, started following these men and documenting um, the pathogenesis of syphilis in these men. And in 1934 and 1936, published two very big papers, very popular papers. And it was decided after that that they were going to continue the study. Um, I do want to mention, um, before I forget, so the treatment for syphilis at this time was incredibly painful. It often re required injections of mercury um, or some other substance that was toxic. It took months. And it was also, it also had a very low success rate, so about 30%. So it's 1936 and they decide to continue this study. They were not going to try to treat these men. They were just gonna continue to see how the infection progressed. So we skip ahead to 1945 and the discovery of penicillin, which is an incredibly effective treatment for syphilis. And these rapid treatment centers start popping up across the US so that we can, so people can start being treated. But it was decided again that the men in the Tuskegee study were not going to be treated. Um, so we skip ahead to 19, the 1960s. The CDC now becomes involved and they found new new merit to this research. They also incur, or they also kind of recruit local medical agencies. I unfortunately didn't add any to this, um, to this slide, but there are several. And they all supported continuing the study and not treating these men for syphilis, even though penicillin was widely available and very easy. So in 19, I wanna say it was 62, they're, um, they started cycling black medical students through the Tuskegee study and concerns started to be raised about this, um, about the ethics. And um, so eventually 1969, it gets enough coverage and a big news story breaks about this. And it was enough to cause the study to end in 1972. So what were the fallouts after this? So in 1973, Congress holds hearings and there's a class auction lawsuit, which results in a 10 million out of court settlement in 74. Um, so the government sets up this Tuskegee Health Benefit Program that offers lifetime medical benefits and burial services for all the participants. A year later, the wives, widows and offsprings were added. This is important. Um, so in 1972, by the time the study officially ended, a dozen or so of the men had died. Um, but like any sexually transmitted disease, it doesn't stay with that one person. Um, so when the study ended, wives, girlfriends, children were infected with this. So I'm sure like 
like I said, everybody's familiar that syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease, but it can also be transmitted from mother to child in, that, in a, um, a vertical transmission. So as the child is being pushed out during labor and delivery, they pick up all the organisms, all the microflora um, that the mother has. So if the mother is infected with syphilis, the baby will then be infected with syphilis. So wives, widows, and offspring are added in 75. Um, in 95, they also include health and medical benefits. It would be interesting to see how many were still alive at that point. It was something I didn't look into, but something that might be interesting to, to dig, dig into. 1997 was when President Clinton offered a, an official apology on behalf of the nation to the remaining participants and their families. 2004, CDC, so uh, Center for Disease Control, funded $10 million to what it was the Tuskegee Institute, but is now the Tuskegee University to start a bioethics research and healthcare center. That center opens in 2006. Oh, and I forgot to mention that the last participant of the study, or of the study died in 2004. So the bioethics center opens in 06, um, and then the last widow receiving those Tuskegee health benefit um, from that program dies in 2009. So this official apology, one, little quick quip that I grabbed was an apology is the first step and we take it with a commitment to rebuild that broken trust. So this is from Bill Clinton. I forgot to add this um, the citation. But um, so he realizes that there there needs there's something else needs to be done. The, the apology is just the first step. You know, that's all we can do in the moment. But he had three ideas, three goals that he wanted to um, address the bioethics of this study. So the first was to give a grant to the Bioethics Center, which we saw was um, granted in 2004 and the center opened in 2006. The second was to increase community involvement. And the third was to strengthen researcher bioethics training. So we know the first one has been taken care of. Second one, we'll, we'll hold off until the end. The second or the third one I do want to talk about because it is in my, um, my field. So current standards in human research. So there is an Office of Human Research Protections formed underneath the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and they are responsible for having all of the guidelines and enforcing ethical um, principles and guidelines when conducting human research or using human subjects. So they have these three ideas. We, need, we have respect for the subjects, um, beneficence, and justice. So respect for, respect for the subjects. The res subjects are autonomous. And this was an issue with the Tuskegee study because the samples that were taken from these men were no longer theirs once they were taken from them. They had no control over what was going on. So the researchers had the potential to use that data to create a product, whether it be um, like a, an antibody test or a treatment, and then collect um, and then be paid for it. But any income that they made from technologies made from the data or from the, the um, data collected from these men didn't have to go back to the test subjects. Um, and this is also an issue with the um, with Henrietta Henrietta Lacks. So if you're interested in reading another uh, another uh, kind of ties into this, the immortal life of Henrietta Henrietta Lacks. So taking tissue from somebody without their consent. Um, profiting off of it because he, HELOC cells are still used to this day. Um, they're very, very um, incremental to, to cancer research. But it all comes down to, you know, they're, these people are making money off of tissue samples taken from these subjects and the subjects get absolutely nothing. So they have this autonomous state and we need to treat them with respect. Um, and this idea of informed consent became very important. So the individual must know what the, what the study is. They need to know all of the benefits. They need to know all of the um, potential missteps or risks. They need to know all the risks. Um, they need to be able to give that informed consent. If they're not, if they have diminished autonomy, there needs to be um, there's special precautions that come up when they, in order to get that informed consent. There's also um, special or um, special guidelines for vulnerable populations like prisoners, children, and pregnant women. Um, so the beneficence portion, so people are treated in an ethical manner. Um, they need to be protected from harm. You need to make sure that the study is formed in such a way to mitigate all risk to the patient. 
and they need to be chosen fairly and benefits of the study need to be equitably distributed. And another office that focuses specifically on minority health and health equity is part of this as part of the CDC. So they have this office of minority health and health equity and they have um, funding. So grants to um, for PIs that want to study minority health and health equity. They have training. They have it's, it's a really big resource for anybody who wants to study this. So this comes, I finally come to my or my discussion. So health disparities, for anybody who this is, this is brand new to and are curious, health disparities, it's usually um, different populations. When you compare populations, one is suffering different rate, they suffer different rates of like incidence, prevalence, mortality, burden of disease, and other adverse health conditions. And so this is what we see in a lot of minority minority communities, especially in the black community, um, where cancer rates are a lot higher, hypertension. And we're seeing it with the COVID pandemic too, where death rates in some cities for African-Americans are closer to 70%, um, which is absolute, it's astronomical. Um, and so what we get from this Tuskegee study, and unfortunately it's not the only example, there are plenty of other examples out there where um, vulnerable populations, minority populations have been exploited in the name of science. So we're looking at a lot of distrust um, with this because it's, it, it, it's really baffling. The study went on for 40 years and it ended not that long ago. So there's still distrust in the community. And that means there's a reluctance to participate in biomedical research, which is, um, it's, it, it's, this part really fascinates me because I do study genetics. There's not a lot, it's, it's like we have to, in order to have like a complete genome that we can then go compare personal genomes to, we have to collect enough to kind of make this mosaic, like get a very good idea with as many samples as possible. We don't have that for African-Americans, unfortunately. So a lot of like the tailored, gene specific therapies are really difficult to do in minorities or add like adverse effects. So if you have um, one gene or a, a particular code, that means you're going to respond differently to a pharmaceutical. We also don't know that information um, because there is this reluctance to participate in biomedical research. We don't, people don't know where their samples are going to do, what results they're going to have. It, it's a lot of distrust. They also won't seek preventative treatment, which we know is very imperative in order to maintain um, good health. And they won't utilize, they're less likely to utilize vaccines, um, blood and organ donations. So all these things that would benefit our communities, we're not seeking out because of this, this great mistrust. And I really couldn't find that, that second point that Clinton had talked about um, of reaching out and building the community. I couldn't find any instance of that being done. And it's because it's, it's very difficult, but it's something that, you know, giving money to a school to set up a program, that's, that's one thing. And then having an organization come up with guidelines to make sure things are ethical, that was also easy. But the community, building trust with the community has been left out. And then we also have issues um, like uneven distribution of resources along racial lines and underrepresentation of African-Americans in healthcare professions that also um, tie into these health disparities. Um, and with that, there are my references, um, some essays, um, some articles that were I thought were worth reading, and then all of the websites that I collected my data from. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that information, Amber. Uh, unfortunately, with the, the audio issue that we had a little earlier, we missed some of the information that you provided, especially on why Tuskegee was selected for uh, this study. Are you able to just take us back to the first two slides and go yeah. over some of that that was missed? Oh, of course, of course. Um, let me just pull that up. Okay, so the reason Tuskegee was chosen, um, they had a really high rate of syphilis. Um, so the national average was estimated at about 35% of reproductive adults with syphilis. Um, Tuskegee had a rate of 
30, which was incredibly high. Um, so that was one of the reasons. And then another reason was because the population was very vulnerable, vulnerable, right? They were illiterate, um, very poor, and it was very easy to come to this, to this group because it, it, it was, they really only offered, you know, medical exams, and I'm not exactly sure how, how those medical exams were, and burial insurance. So they really didn't have to get informed consent. They offered them something that was, you know, too good to be true. Um, and I guess to go back just a little bit further, the syphilis epidemic and the, the Wall, Street, Wall Street crash. So going back, so syphilis is rampant through the U.S. along with um, yellow fever, cholera, those are all issues. And then we have the Wall Street crash. So the federal government saw all of these diseases as a hindrance to um, progress. So they wanted to study. So these, the, um, the, the USPHS decided to focus on syphilis, but syphilis is incredibly difficult to culture. Um, you can't do it in a lab. You, I, I think to this day, there are still issues. Um, Unfortunately, there are some that grow really well, like COVID-19 can be cultured in a lab and we can study it and nobody, no human um, has to be involved whatsoever. But with syphilis, the best that they had was to study it in a person. So they decided, you know, here's this population of, um, you know, uneducated, illiterate people. We, they offered them the burial insurance and the medical exams and they proposed, because I think they were trying to do something bigger um, a little more thorough, but funding was cut. Um, so they settled on just this observational study, the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the Negro male. And so um, they were just going to document it. Like what, what is the disease progression? If we know the disease progression, we can maybe treat it better, more effectively, because they had no treatment at that time either. They had the injections of, you know, mercury for three to six months and the success rate was only like 30 percent so you have this population that has um pretty equal percent or percent infection rate compared to the national average and then you have this vulnerable population who's really not going to um make too much of a fuss and they and they really thought that they were they were getting benefits from this you know they got the burial insurance they were getting exams they thought they were being treated because a lot, like I said, a lot of them didn't know that they had syphilis. They thought, you know, they just used the local term of bad blood and that they were being treated and that that was that. Um, so then you have these, you have these publications and of, of course in, in research it's publish or die and I, I don't think it was any different back then. You have these big publications that were, that in the researchers' minds were making contributions to science, right? We're understanding this a bit better, even though there are other ways that they could have done it that didn't um, exploit this population. So in 19, 1945, penicillin comes out, but it's still decided that they're not going to, um, they're not going to treat these men. They, they, want, to, they want to follow this. And I think the intent would, was to follow them till death. Um, support from the study actually it, it gained when the CDC came in and decided that there was merit to the study along with local um, medical agencies in the area. They all decided it was worth merit. So in, in into the 60s, these men are still untreated. I, I'm certain many of them still didn't know that they had syphilis. And then it took exposure from a news story. It finally got enough coverage in 19... Uh, 1969 to then have it end in 1972. Um, and did you want me to continue to the next slide? If you can. Yes. Okay. Please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so in 1973, this is this is the fallout afterwards. So a year later, Congress opens hearings to to better understand, you know, where where did they where did the study go wrong? Understanding the ethics behind conducting research on humans, um, along with the class action lawsuit that was filed on behalf of the study participants, they were awarded 10 million out of court, um, an out of court settlement, and then the government set up this Tuskegee Health Benefit Bro um, Program that offered lifetime medical benefits along with burial services. Um, in 75, the wives, widows, and offspring were added to the program, and I don't understand why it took so long, because as the study was going on and as these men were allowed to 
continue without knowing what they're um, they were infected with and without being treated, they were infecting their loved ones. You know, they were in infecting their wives, their girlfriends, their children, because, you know, syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease, but it can also be transmitted um, vertically from mother to child. So as the child comes out of the, the birthing canal, they pick up all that microflora that the mom has. So if the mom has syphilis, the child will pick up syphilis um, when they're born. So they were finally added in 1975. Finally, in 95, the medical, uh, medical benefits were included into that um, THBP program. In 2004, or sorry, let me go back. So 1997 is when President Clinton offered that apology. And that one, that first goal that he had was to give money to the Tuskegee University. And that happened in 2004 with a 10 million donation to open their bioethics research core. Um, this is also the year that the last Tuskegee participant dies. So the um, Tuskegee University has their formal opening of the bioethics centered in 2006, and it still operates today. Um, and then in 2009, the last widow receiving these benefits dies. And does that catch us up? Uh, I think so, Amber. Thank you so much again. Yeah. We appreciate your patience and <laughs> going back and reviewing that. Sorry for the tech trouble that you yeah. had, but that was a, a wealth of great information. So we appreciate it. Um, oh, we've had some really good questions come in already. We're going to cover those during the question and answer portion at the end of the event. And just as a reminder to folks, if you have questions that come up during the event, please post them in the comments and we will try our best to cover them uh, during the open question and answer period at the end. Up next, we're going to have a presentation on physical and dental health in the Black community. And presenting on that will be Dr. Judy Green and Dr. Tracy Moore. We'll start with uh, Dr. Green. She is a proud graduate of Central State University and HBCU in Wilberforce, Ohio. She received her medical degree from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, and training in diagnostic imaging at the University of Cincinnati. She retired after practicing for 36 years and most recently practiced women's imaging for 10 years in Phoenix, Arizona with Valley uh, radiologists. Uh, after her presentation will be Dr. Tracy Moore, who uh, received an Associate of Science degree from Temple University, a Bachelor of Science degree from Westchester University, a Master of Science degree from St. Joseph's mm -hmm. University, and a Doctorate of Education from Wilmington University. Her numerous publications include a book chapter about minority women in educational leadership, several articles in Dimensions of Dental Hygiene magazine, a book chapter titled uh, Teledentistry and Dental Hygiene, a children's book book titled, I Want to Be a Dental High Genius, uh, and her dissertation, The Diversity Dilemma, a National Study of Minorities in Dental Hygiene Programs. Currently, she is the first ever African-American department chair in the 40-year history of the Northern Arizona University Department of Dental Hygiene, located in Flagstaff, Arizona, appointed in uh, 2016. Welcome, Dr. Green and Dr. Moore. Oh, thank you. And thanks for inviting me to speak on such an important and timely topic. Um, as the saying goes, when America gets a cold, Black America gets pneumonia. This has never been found to be truer as evidenced by the current coronavirus epidemic. Uh, through July 28th, about 150,000 Americans have died from the COVID-19 virus. While Blacks are 13% of the U.S. population, our death rate is 25%. To put that in perspective, Blacks are about 3.7 times more likely to die from the virus, while Indigenous people are 3.5 times, Pacific Islanders 3.8 times, and Latinx 2.5 times more likely to die. Why is this occurring? Well, systemic racism takes a toll on healthy communities of color and COVID serves as a magnifying glass to help us see these healthcare disparities. Almost 21% of Black Americans live in poverty, and it's well-known people with lower education, lower incomes, smaller support systems, 
less access to quality care and quality foods experience poor health outcomes. Due to institutional discrimination, Blacks and people of color are more likely to end up in occupations leaving them at a higher risk of exposure and lacking the resources to access health care. As we know, fewer Blacks have the privilege of working from home, and therefore many Black Americans are in the category of the so-called essential workers. These include, but are not limited to, the, to those working in a, a retail, such as grocery store workers, sanitation workers, farming, meat packaging plants, healthcare workers in nursing homes, and in early childhood and, and early childhood educators. Many of these jobs don't provide health care benefits or even supply adequate PPE for protection. Often these workers rely on public transportation, making physical distancing impossible. The nature of their jobs may, may also prevent this, as we've seen in a recent outbreak in uh, multiple work uh, meat processing plants throughout the uh, country. These jobs don't pay a living wage, which necessitates many working people living together in dense multi-generational households, living in proximity with those who may also be the uh, essential workers, makes it unlikely that there is physical distancing. And in the, if, if someone does get the virus, the possibility of quarantining is, is impossible. We're asking low paid workers to take on an enormous amount of risk with very little reward. Access to healthcare and testing is also a barrier as is quality of care in minority neighborhoods. Access to virtually every type of thera therapeutic intervention in the US ranging from high technology procedures to the most basic forms of diagnostic and treatment options are limited. Blacks and other minorities receive fewer procedures and poorer medical care than whites. Hospitals and physicians, as we know, tend to be in more affluent, particularly white areas, which leave hospitals that serve primarily black patients overburdened and understaffed. Mistrust plagues also, also mis, uh, mistrust also plagues the doctor-patient relationship. And uh, this has been especially noted after the Tuskegee experiment, which caused the sub blacks not to seek care and distrust uh, their healthcare professionals. There's also a wide variety of bias and stereotypes among healthcare workers, which can lead to disparities. We've all heard of black people being turned away after uh, numerous attempts to get COVID testing, and they subsequently return to the hospital with severe advanced infections or have even been found dead in their homes. More minority physicians who are better able to communicate with and empathize with these patients would help to alleviate this problem. There are only 5% of physicians in, U in the US that are black as of 2018. Yet Blacks in the general population make up 13%. Um, bias in, in women's reproductive health is a, is a prime example of how this can lead to adverse outcomes. As we've recently uh, been uh, aware of, Black women are three to four times more likely to die in childbirth, and Black infant mortality is twice that of white infants a combination of institutional racism and lack of access to quality prenatal care is the cause. Why would, um, would, would Black women in the care of Black physicians have different outcomes? I, I just want to pose this question. Black women are also 42% more likely to die of breast cancer because they're in more advanced stages of the disease when they first uh, present. This is due to either limited access to healthcare or no coverage at all. Another example is that one in five women who did not have breast reconstruction after mastectomy report not knowing about the procedure, despite the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act, which requires most group health insurance plans that cover mastectomies to also cover breast reconstruction. Let's finally look at the, uh, at the risk factors of obesity, 
cancer, diabetes, and asthma, which are all prevalent in Black Americans. All have been linked to increased susceptibility to severe forms of the coronavirus. Obesity is defined as a body mass index of 30 or higher, and about 38% of Black men and 56% of Black women are obese, as reported by CDC data obtained between 2015 and 2017. The poor are at risk for obesity, not because they're lazy or they eat too much. They simply can't afford high quality, healthy food for their family. It's less expensive to feed their family foods that contribute to obesity. Additionally, those who are, in, those who are poor often are unable to exercise because their neighborhoods are unsafe for walking and a gym membership is simply too expensive. Also, many of these um, essential workers or, or poor income laborers are working two to three part-time jobs, which leaves little time for exercise. Also, there are many black neighborhoods that exist in food deserts, which limit direct access to fresh and healthy foods. The larger groceries may be far away and access difficult if there's no means of direct transportation. All of these obstacles negatively impact health and must be addressed. Diabetes, as we know, is also more prevalent in African-Americans. While there is a history or there is a hereditary cause of diabetes, there is also a link between diabetes and both hypertension and obesity. Both of these we know are higher in the African-American population. While knowledge of this coronavirus is incomplete because it's, it's new to us, there is no direct causal relationship between COVID-19 and diabetes. However, having diabetes does make one more susceptible to severe illnesses and worse outcomes if infected. The good news is that you can lower your risk of getting very sick from COVID-19 if, you, well, if, you, if your diabetes is well managed and uh, under control. When people with diabetes do not manage it well and experience fluctuating, fluctuating blood sugars, they are generally at risk for a number of diabetic related complications, which could compromise your abilities to fight off severe complications or death from COVID. Asthma and COPD also pose risk factors for development of COVID. Um, African-American women are 20% more likely to has, have asthma than whites. And African-Americans are three times more likely to die from asthma related causes. African-American children are as much as 10 times more likely to die than compared to white children. All these causes remain un Clear, however, African-American children are frequently exposed to secondhand smoke. And as we know, a lot of black neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods uh, are plagued by environmental pollution with poor air quality. Smokers and those with COPD are also more likely to develop severe complications from coronavirus. Cancer is another risk factor for development of COVID-19. Patients undergoing both oral and IV chemotherapy are at risk for severe outcomes from COVID-19. However, those in remission are less likely at no additional risk than the general population. This is because chemotherapy weakens the immune system, which is what it's supposed to do. It is important, however, that all cancer patients and survivors whether currently in treatment or not, speak with their physician about this. Lastly, I have to stress prevention again. You should definitely avoid high-risk activities such as going to gyms, uh, participating in large social gatherings, going to bars, and in-rest dining. Wear a mask, practice frequent hand washing and social distancing, regularly clean and disinfect frequently touched objects, and you can um, somewhat control this or, or lower your risk by practicing good control of pre-existing conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, and asthma. 
I would also like to point you to a, a really recently released, really good recently released podcast. It's called Black Doctors Speak. It is put on by Black doctors for Black patients. Um, again, stay home and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. And up next, we have Dr. Moore presenting on uh, Black dental health. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Green, for the introduction regarding medical disparities. But before we talk about oral health disparities, we must acknowledge that we are here in Arizona or Native American land. So we just wanted to acknowledge that the land that we, the school sits on is Native American land and we recognize their past, present and future. Dr. Green alluded to health disparities. Why do we have health disparities? There is an unequal distribution of resources which affects minorities and poor populations at higher percentages. As a result, you have higher rates of chronic disease, which is demonstrated through stroke, heart disease, and diabetes. And also, as Dr. Green alluded to earlier, higher rates of premature death due to COVID-19. What are the oral health indicators? Well, mental, I'm sorry, medical and dental are separated. The medical community does not talk to the dental community. And so that is not good because the mouth is the gateway to the body. How do we know this? We know this because if you look in someone's mouth and they have oral candidiasis, that is an indication that they may have HIV. If you look in someone's mouth and they have cold sores, that is a sign that they may have herpes simplex virus. If you look in someone's mouth, and see on their hands and they have warts, that is a sign that they may have herpetic papillomavirus. And if you look in someone's mouth and see canker sores and oral lesions, that could be a sign that they may have cancer. So even though the medical division treats the body and the dental division treats the mouth, they are connected because you can have signs and symptoms in your mouth that indicate there is a systemic issue going on in the rest of your body. Why do people avoid the dentist? Well, as we heard earlier from Ms. Jones, many African-Americans are fearful of going to any doctor, let alone a dentist, due to histor the historical Tuskegee experiments and other lack of attention that's being paid to African-Americans when they go to the doctor. Like Dr. Green alluded to earlier, if there's a white physician, can this physician provide the best care for an African-American person? Maybe, maybe not. Across all different demographics, the, the number one reason why folks do not go to the dentist is because they don't have the funding, low income. Some people don't have insurance, some people do have insurance. Even with insurance, there's a copay, and many cannot afford that, fu that funding, that copay that is associated with a dental visit. What is oral health connection? Oral health is integral to overall general good health. For example, heart disease, diabetes, has, has all been attributed to lack of oral health attention. If you have high rates of gum disease, chances are the bacteria gives you a direct connection to heart disease and diabetes. Pregnant women who have gum disease typically give birth to babies that are either born too early or born low weight. What happens when we have impaired oral health? Your diet is affected. You cannot eat properly. Your nutrition is affected. You lose sleep. Some people cannot go to work. And when their teeth are affected, they have less social interaction. The most famous case of an African-American boy who died in 2007 of an abscess tooth, his name was Diamante Driver. He lived in Maryland, Prince George's County, Maryland, outside of DC. 
And the reason why he, he died was because his mother had Medicare, Medicaid. She took him to the dentist. The dentist refused to treat Diamante because of her Medicaid insurance. He went back to school. It got worse. The, the dental infection got worse. She took him to the emergency room where they started to treat him. They gave him antibiotics and sent him home. It got worse again. Next thing you know, he's in the hospital. He wound up having over $250,000 worth work, $250,000 worth of work done in his mouth to save him. But at the end of the day, the abscess had spread from his tooth to his brain and he died of an infection. He could have been saved if someone had taken his insurance simply by $80 dental examination and extracting that bad decayed tooth. So we can see that overall, if African-Americans have Medicare, Medicaid, and are being treated in the dental community and these dentists are not accepting their insurance, they will not have the much needed attention for their mouths because the dentists are discriminated against them due to the, the type of insurance that they have. And that is across all age groups. So we know that dental health affects minorities, most importantly, children, adults, lower income. Then you have the elderly and the special needs population, which also has adults, children, and elderly. Here in Arizona, the average third grade child, 64% have decay. 28% have untreated decay and 74% need dental sealants, which are a preventive type of coating over the tooth that may get decay. If we dig a little deeper, we can see that a high proportion rate of third grade African-American children, specifically 69% have a tooth decay experience, 41% need dental sealants, but 71% have untreated tooth decay. When we talk about Medicare, Medicaid, most of the elderly do not have dental services. 33% have severe dental tooth loss. 68% have had a dental visit in the past year. And most of them have what is known as the Arizona Healthcare Cost Containment System or ACCESS. Unfortunately, ACCESS will only treat the elderly in an emergency situation. For our special needs children under the age of 18, only 20% have had a dental visit in the past year, which is based on 13% of the population. And for the adults, only 72% have been to the dentist in the past year. Most of them do not have dental insurance. And 59% have no insurance, 70% have no money to pay when you have a copay with the insurance. What are the cause of these disparities? Well, as we alluded to earlier, we have social factors, lack of education. Some communities have no preventive care. They have no education about preventive care. They don't know about how to go to the dentist or to the hygienist to seek preventive care. And if they are informed about it, they have no way to, to get there. There's no transportation. Many of them live in areas where there's no access to a dentist. Some dentists only have offices in the inner cities. Some of these folks live in rural areas and there's no access to rural areas. Their attitudes, the dentists have various attitudes regarding how they feel about certain people. It could be sexism, it could be ageism, it could be racism. So a lot of dentists have preconceived notions and they believe in the stereotypes about certain demographics of folks. Therefore, they don't want to treat an African-American patient that comes to their office. What about the individual factors? Well, some people have poor diets. Their hygiene is poor as a result, and they have a bad attitude when they do present to the dentist because of their diet and their attitude. Economic factors. Many of them do not have access to health services, and if they do, the cost is astronomically high. If they do have insurance, it's usually Medicare, Medicaid, or access, which only will be accepted by few dentists in certain areas. Other, ba other barriers are language. Many people do not speak the language 
the dental language, the, the jargon. They don't understand the, the dental terms. Some people have various cultural differences and nuances. And as a result, you cannot infringe Western medicine and Western dentistry onto someone who has cultural differences and feel like the cultural piece can be ignored. It cannot be ignored. The Western type of medicine, it needs to be incorporated with the cultural piece. And many people don't have those resources. They don't have, you know, a means to get here, to get there. They just don't have the, the resources available to them to be able to afford to go to the dentist or to seek preventive care from the hygienist. So when we talk about Arizona specifically, we are in a health professional shortage area. There is an unequal distribution of healthcare professionals. 32% of dentists participate in access with the national average being 42%. However, 15% of Arizona's population is underserved and living in a dental shortage area. Here in Flagstaff, we have less than 14 dentists for 4,000 denizens. In Coconino County, which is where we live here in Flagstaff, we have 109 dentists for 125,000 people. Maricopa County, that's down in Phoenix area, they have the most dentists, 2,800 for 3 million people. But in Greenlee County, which is out near the reservation, they only have one dentist for 8,000 people. How can we kind of balance the scales with regard to oral health? Well, we need more minority providers who have cultural awareness. We need more pathways to increase minority providers through school pipeline programs. We need community activism because government policy needs to change to promote health equity. In certain states, in Minnesota, there's mandatory implicit bias training for all healthcare providers. And in other states, they have mandatory cultural competency training for all healthcare professionals. We need our public health facilities to be more open and welcome to persons of color. And we need multidisciplinary healthcare teams to have a comprehensive approach to address the social determinants of health. Again, we need the medical physician and the dentist to work together, the nurse practitioner with the physician assistant, the social worker with the hygienist and the dental therapist and the physical therapist with the occupational therapist. Those are my references. Thank you for your attention and your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Tam. We appreciate that information and have a few questions that came through for you that we'll touch on uh, during the question and answer period. Up next, we're going to cover a section on the mental health of Black America. Uh, that section will be covered by Mr. David Morrow and Mr. Jermaine Barkley. Up first will be uh, Mr. Morrow. David Morrow is a graduate of Arizona State University. Uh, he graduated with his uh, Bachelor of Science in Sociology. He is a loving father of five and a loving husband. David is also the owner of several small businesses in the Phoenix metropolitan area, uh, Demo Community Services, Tomorrow Consulting, and Tomorrow Homes. Through these entities, David aids small business owners for find niche markets, provides individual counseling, vocational rehabilitation, uh, case management, and sober living services to those in neighboring communities. It has not only been David's goal to solve longstanding systemic problems within our community, but his lifelong mission. Following him will be uh, Mr. Jermaine Barkley. Uh, Jermaine completed his undergraduate degree in psychology at Northern Arizona University and is currently rounding out his master's through ASU in applied sociology. Active in the Flagstaff community, he has worked in the fields of criminal justice, trauma, and mental health for the past eight years. Currently, Jermaine works as the first episode uh, psychosis grant specialist for Health Choice AZ, the Regional Behavioral Health Authority for the Northern Arizona region. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It. All right. <clears throat> so I appreciate all the stats that were shared by Dr. Green, Dr. Moore. 
Um, I'm really going to change my strategy here because this is mental health. And in, in order to break down these stigmas and some of these barriers, um, we really have to talk about realistic things that are going on in our community. So this story is about a 12 year old boy um, who was picked up from school by his grandfather, by his uncle, which wasn't typical for him. He was typically picked up by his father. Um, and in the air, you could tell something was wrong. So they were rushed to a hospital where the young boy saw his dad. So his relief disappeared. Um, everything seemed okay, but his father was crying. So he, he immediately asked, you know, what was going on? Um, and he was told that his three-year-old sister had passed away of pneumonia. And that three-year-old girl was my sister when I was in sixth grade. Um, with that, it kind of shows us that the barrier that was faced is my mother took my, my sister to an ER on Friday. That ER doctor was a white lady. I was there. I recall this day, my mother was hysterical. She knew something was wrong with my sister, but the doctor did not take her seriously. So she sent my sister home and said, wait over the weekend. Um, come Monday, my sister was very lethargic. I left to go to school. And before the school day was over, my sister had passed away. When I got to the doctor and when I got to the hospital and I saw my dad, the doctor that was there helping us was an African-American woman and she was crying with my family. And it shows that there's this, there's this, there's this disconnect between certain, certain doctors with our culture and others. So um, I really want to touch on the stigmas first. Um, we're a resilient culture and I was raised in such a way where, you know, we kind of have to shake it off. I was not offered the opportunity to go to see a counselor, to talk to a counselor about this trauma. My family did not seek out counseling to go discuss this loss of a child. Um, <clears throat> not only was there a stigma, but there were barriers to achieving that. Um, so here in Arizona, um, as Dr. Moore discussed, um, there's access health insurance. Um, where I grew up, that insurance did not cover counseling. So in order for my family to achieve that counseling, one, my parents would have to take off work because most counselors are available nine to five. So then that's a financial loss. And so instead of doing that, obviously parents decide to go to work. Um, and then on top of that, there were not some of the luxuries of video conferencing, teleconferencing um, to achieve those services from home. So if we think about systemically why this is such a problem, where we make up about 12% of the population here in the US, we make up half of the prison population. We make up pretty close to half of the foster care system as well as 40% of the homeless population. So when you're in those populations, you have an increased opportunity of seeing violence. Your socioeconomic level is obviously low and you're depending on a system that systemically oppresses us. So we have to work on adjusting our stigmas by being able to communicate with individuals um, in a way that they can understand. And the best way we can do that is to increase our cultural competency um, and I believe that the best way to break down that barrier is to increase the amount of African-American clinicians we have in the system. So um, as Ms. Lewis said in my intro, it's been my lifelong mission because in college, my brother was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And my brother, he did not want to talk to any doctor, no doctor, no doctor. And I just told myself that I don't understand why he doesn't want help, but it wasn't that he didn't want help. He didn't believe that the individuals he was speaking with understood him. In the moment that he met with a African-American doctor, a male that understood where he came from and could relate to his experiences, he was able to open up and receive the treatment he needed to live a successful life. So with that, I believe that in our system, what we need to change the most is the definition of cultural competence, competency. 
Um, Cause we have a reliance training system that all of our clinicians have to engage in. And I don't believe that an eight hour class can align a different culture with another culture. We really need to increase our staff, our workforce, diversi diversify the workforce and ensure there's someone that can meet everyone's need. So I'll leave you with one last story. Um, I had a gentleman knock on my door not too long ago and he asked for a new clinician. And I, I'm not a clinician, by the way, um, I'm a businessman. So he said he wanted a new clinician and I was wondering why he asked me instead of his, his counselor. And he said, well, you know, I just felt like I could talk to you because you look like, you know, somebody that would be my friend. And I said, okay, well, um, your counselor is also a, a black gentleman, you know, close to your age. He said, I know, I know that's, that's my problem. I can't express myself about things that I went through in my childhood with somebody that is like my friend. And I found that very interesting because everything that we preach is that we need more individuals like us, but sometimes that's not the case. And really cultural competency means meeting someone exactly where they're at and providing them a service that works best for them. So I thank you guys for your time and uh, I will pass the torch to Mr. Berkeley. Thank you so much for that information. And before we uh, move on to Mr. Berkeley, uh, we just wanna thank the audience for your engagement with the subjects that we've been covering so far. Um, we know that there was a little bit of um, of uh, a delay earlier in the presentation. Um, and we want to be sure that we touch on your questions as best as we can at the end of the presentation. So we want to make sure you know that we are going to be going over the scheduled time by a little more than 10 minutes. to make sure we touch on as many of those questions as we can. Um, so Mr. Berkeley, please take it away. Beautiful, beautiful. And I'm just getting my PowerPoint queued up here. Okay, great. Well, hello, everyone. I, I am so honored to spend my evening with you all. Um, and among such impressive peers, no less, to talk about something very near and dear to my heart. Um, like you heard in the introduction, my name is Jermaine Barkley. Um, I've been a Flagstaff resident for a little over eight years now, working in the fields of mental health, criminal justice, homelessness, and trauma. And I'm here to talk to you a bit about the state of mental health in the Black community, more specifically, how stress and trauma relate to the Black experience in America and some of the consequences of that. Uh, now, the experience of being Black in America can be defined through a lens of chronic stress and trauma. Uh, the reality is living through experiences like discrimination, institutionalized racism, over-policing and police brutality, and constant barriers to equity is extremely stressful, and it can produce a lot of trauma. Um, Black people experience a disproportionate amount of stress compared to other ethnic groups, and a large contributor to that is living in a society that enforces institutional racism and inequity. So those stressors can be extremely traumatic, and experiencing that emotional weight consistently leads to long-term detrimental consequences, which I want to touch on today. So first, let's talk about trauma. It's hard to understand why we're so stressed without describing trauma. No one would deny that we're living in unprecedented stressful times uh, between a pandemic, historically damaged economy, whispers of aliens in the New York Times. I think we're all experiencing a pretty big baseline of stress. However, I think a theme you'll notice tonight is for a variety of contributing factors, our people, the Black community, are consistently disproportionately affected by these things, things like COVID-19, racial injustice, et cetera. And the effects of uh, overexposure to stress over and over and over again can lead to diminished physical health, frequent trips to the hospital and the doctors, social withdrawal, difficulty forming relationships that are healthy, frequent nightmares, trouble sleeping, risky behaviors, flashbacks, and more. People who've experienced trauma due to a crisis or traumatic experience might perceive a situation a lot differently than those without that trauma. So let's relate this to racism or something like police brutality. We see it day in and day out through the Black experience. And so our notion of things like policing, the education system, securing housing, is painted much more different 
than those of Caucasian or other ethnic backgrounds, because oftentimes our experiences with those normal institutions have a traumatic aspect, aspect to those. So let's take a, a slightly deeper dive into trauma. So there's two different types of trauma uh, that's important to know. Uh, personal traumatic events, those are things like sexual assault, discrimination and racial violence, domestic violence, things that happen directly to you, and public traumatic events, things like natural disasters, war, or community violence, let's say a police shooting in your neighborhood. Either way, what's important to remember is that trauma and stress is on a spectrum. So what might be traumatic to me might not be traumatic to you whatsoever. Um, something that I think is important to talk about is we often take for granted sometimes just how traumatic these things can be. So someone being killed or dying on video, right? That, that's been a big spark of the Black Lives Matter movement. But we often forget that seeing something like that is extremely traumatic, right? It, it's not normal to see someone die day in and day out. And as social media has evolved and the way that we document our injustices has evolved, we're exposed to these really intense um, um, instances of injustices and it's front and center and it can be traumatic whether we know it or not, especially when the person being victimized looks like you, looks like your friends, looks like your neighbors, your children, your loved ones, that leaves an emotional toll, right? And living your life day in and day out and day in and day out with things like the statistics of police violence and discrimination in the back of your mind is really stressful. Other people may take for granted just how traumatic it can be to be made to feel like the other, right? To have your race called out, to uh, have someone use a slur against you. There have been studies that have shown the use of the N-word um, can be likened to a physical threat against your well-being. Um, being followed in the store, or having an offensive joke made about you, being put in a position of the other, denied service, is really traumatic. Uh, the constant theme in these examples is that it can make you feel unsafe. And consistently feeling unsafe creates a lot of stress. Trauma is trauma, and exposure to that trauma is really, really stressful. So I know what you're thinking, seeing your screen right now. Um, how can I contract you to do some Photoshop skills for me? Uh, please feel free to email us after the fact. I am available for Photoshop opportunities. I don't know if you remember the ad campaigns in the 60s and 70s, that this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs. Well, what I want to talk to you about is what your brain looks like when experiencing a traumatic event. Um, there are four important aspects of your brain to take note of. The amygdala, that's your fear and response center. Um, the, the hypothalamus, that helps release cortisol, a stress hormone, increase sugars and adrenaline, the hippocampus, which helps encode memory, and the prefrontal cortex. I like to throw those words in there to make me sound smarter than I am. Um, but the way that these interact during a crisis situation is this. Uh, let's say that you have been pulled over by a police officer, right? And you're experiencing a lot of anxiety because you've seen videos of police brutality. What might happen is your amygdala, your fear and response center, is going to kick in the hyperdrive, right? Your hypothalamus is then going to release a lot of cortisol, adrenaline, sugars into your body, stress hormones. Uh, your hippocampus is going to take bits and pieces from your experience and encode that into your memory. And your prefrontal cortex, which is in charge of logic, decision-making, planning, shuts down. It shuts down in a moment of trauma. And this happens every time you experience a traumatic event. And then you'll either fight, flight, or freeze, right? We know those as common responses to a crisis situation. Uh, it makes logical decision-making really difficult, and it can have long-lasting effects, especially relating to your hippocampus, right? Uh, experiencing traumatic events can encode images and cues in your mind that, that bring you to this response even quicker the next time you're stressed out. That's what we know as, as triggers. So again, you've got your fight, flight, uh, and freeze responses. Back in the day, and by back in the day, I mean tens of thousands of years ago, this was absolutely crucial to our survival uh, as, as cavemen, right? Back in caveman times, if a saber-toothed tiger jumped out of a bush, you didn't have time for logic, um, for in-depth decision-making. You had to react, and you had to react really quick to increase your chances of survival. Like, imagine now, wherever you're sitting, that a tiger, bam, bursts into your room, right? Unexpectedly into your room. What you're not going to do is look at the tiger, guess its weight, try to figure out if it looks hungry, try to think of the statistics of tiger attacks, uh, try to figure out if this tiger looks mean or nice. 
Um, think of other times you've been attacked by a tiger. That's not what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that amygdala is going to kick in. Your hypothalamus is going to flood your body with stress hormones. Your prefrontal cortex is going to shut down so you're not asking yourself all of these questions that's wasting time. You're going to encode a couple of images into your memory to prepare you for this better next time. And you're going to fight that tiger. You're going to run from that tiger or you're going to freeze. And back in the day, this was a really important response to have, right? When we were attacked by animals, when it was life and death constantly. But what happens in modern times when that tiger, the image of that tiger is replaced by a blue uniform, a racial slur, uh, being looked at a certain way in the store, a certain tone of voice regarding your race and your appearance, right? And now day in and day out, you're pumped with this cortisol and and stress because the tiger is no longer a tiger, but it's racism and it's really traumatic. And the triggers that represent racism pop up all over the place in your day-to-day -day life. That's going to leave you with some really long lasting effects. And some of those effects look like depression and anxiety, right? We have disproportionate um, uh, rates of depression and anxiety in our community. Shame and guilt, isolation, uh, having a lot of stress and triggers, emotional dysregulation, uh, trouble concentrating, which is going to affect school and work, risky behaviors, right? Because you're constantly living in this state, whether you know it or not, of survival, of stress, right? And so the consequences of living this way, as, as you can probably see on your screens now, um, are really intense. And, and it goes much, much further than just mental health consequences. Uh, it includes depression and anxiety, but it also includes chronic headaches and migraines. It can lead to heart disease. It can lead to digestive problems, sleep problems, which lead to a whole host of other issues, weight gain, cognitive functioning impairment, the way that you process information, the way that you express intelligence. All of these things are damaged by living in a constant state of stress and trauma, right? So all of these can be attributed as a direct result to chronic stress. And the stressors associated with being Black in America have been linked to literal brain shrinkage in some studies. Literal brain shrinkage, which also increases our risk of Alzheimer's disease. The Black community experiences heart disease as a rate, at a rate higher than other ethnic groups, where the Black community experiences stress at a rate higher than other ethnic groups. So then the question becomes, what do we do? Right? Unlike other forms of stress, chronic stress as a result from racial oppression isn't something we can very simply treat for. Right, We can, of course, provide coping mechanisms and strategies. We can look out for one another, show each other empathy. We can try to go to counseling where it is accessible and affordable and culturally sensitive. But the solution at the end of the day cannot be to teach the Black community to get used to racism and oppression. We can't teach the Black community to get used to this traumatic way of living day in and day out. The stressors of poverty, forced housing inequality over policing, and other forms of discrimination have to be addressed if we want to address the disparities in mental health in the Black community. We've got to go to the source of those stressors, the things that are always in the back of our mind as people of color living in communities and institutions that do not support us. Once we address those, once we strive towards equity, we can more effectively treat the mental health disparities that have resulted from that mistreatment for the past four to 500 years. Here are some links of the studies that I mentioned. And that's it. Thank you so much for that presentation, Jermaine. Uh, no just as a reminder to folks, again, if you have questions for any of the panelists, please be sure to ask those in the comments and we will get to those during the uh, question and answer period. Up next, we have a presentation on the social determinants of health by Dr. Frederick Gooding. Uh, also known as Dr. G. Uh, Dr. Gooding is an associate professor at Texas Christian University's Honors uh, College in Fort Worth, Texas. Dr. Gooding is uh, one who critically analyzes race within contemporary society. His book, American Dream Deferred, Black Federal Workers in Washington, D.C., 1941 to 1981, carefully details the unknown growth and unheralded struggles of Black federal workers in the post-war era. 
Welcome, Dr. G. Thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for all who have been tuning in and are still tuning in. I don't know about you all, but I'm in the state of Texas. I'm two hours ahead, so I'm actually a little bit past my bedtime. But anytime Mayor Carl Evans calls upon me, I have to get up. Anytime Ms. Deb Harris calls upon me, I have to get up. And I'm very appreciative of Ms. Kara House and Bernadine Lewis for bringing me into the circle. Shout out the Freedom Fighters, Dr. Ricardo Guthrie, Sean Thomas, commenting on the fray. And so uh, what am I doing? I'm not trying to diss anybody who I haven't named. Of course, there's a lot of people I can name you know, from uh, my brother Greg and Ethnic Studies, Ethnic Studies to my main man Cuts, uh, you know, holding it down, black business owner, Flagstaff. So I'm not trying to exclude anybody, but what am I doing? When we talk about this idea of the connection between poverty, community, and health, well, that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm recognizing that I'm part of a community, right? Even though I don't live in Fort Worth, Texas, I'm still part of a community. It's called the Black community. I used to live in Flagstaff, and while I was there, I was part of the Black community. And so I still am part of this Black community. And my brother Guthrie can concur. It's called Ubuntu. We went to South Africa and learned this principle. I am who I am because of other people. So here's the deal. Time is short. I know we want, I'm, I'm the main one standing in between Q&A. So I have prepared remarks that I'm simply going to just you know, put to the side and see if they come out naturally in the Q&A. Also, I think I'll be uh, returning to the circle uh, August 5th or something in that nature so we can continue the conversation from there. Or you can just simply give me a shout out through email. But let me just say this really briefly. When we listen to all these presentations, starting off with Jones talking about syphilis and things of this nature, I mean, it is wrong. It is wrong. See, the thing is, just as a human being, well, the question is, how can you do this to a group of people, right? Uh, and so the fact of the matter is, is that um, there's a lot of distrust as we're talking about Jones and Green talking about this idea of not going to the doctor. You know, Morrow gave a very harrowing example, uh, you know, about, you know, personally how this distrust and, you know, bad information is carrying through. And so, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, no, from a very logical standpoint, you're not crazy. You have apprehension about entering into these spaces in which you don't see yourself reflected. I mean, think about it. If you go to your local grocery store and look at the supermarket checkout counter, you don't see anybody looking like you at home and garden on things. Look, if I turn on TV right now, if I flip channels, right, well, now, you know, with the NBA season starting tomorrow, I'll see some Negroes. But what I'm saying is I'm not going to see it reflected. And if I do, chances are they're in the orange jumpsuit, right? Or they're shooting basketball, they're spitting rhymes on, on the mic, right? So in other words, very seldom do we in our own mental health. See, because see, the thing that I'm on when uh, my sister Carrie House is talking about how critically analyzed, I'm on this idea of logical segregation. You, 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 see, you see what I'm saying? See, we stuck on this idea of, you know, uh, water fountains and bathrooms and things of that nature. No, 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 ladies and gentlemen. See, the this, this spirit, see, see, it used to be about whips and chains. Now it's about spirits and brains. See, they have improved their technology. And the question is, have we improved their te te technology, right? Look, look, look at the iPhone, right? Look at the iPhone, right? They're improving their technology. So what I submit to you is that what we're, meant, what we're fighting are the principalities in high places. We're fighting racism 2.0. In other words, they tell you, oh, nothing's wrong. I mean, that part of the problem is that there is no problem. We are still under attack. You heard the presentations. We got the statistics in the data. We're still under attack. And so how do we combat that? Well, Ubuntu, by knowing that I am valued because I'm a part of a community. I recognize my sister. I give a shout out to my brother. So you know what we can do? Little things we can do today is when you're walking down the street, compliment the brother. Compliment the sister. Let uh, Dr. Moore know that she's looking quite nice in that turquoise. And let her mama know she looks good in purple too, right? You, know, you can create because that's what we are always done. We have created in spite of the destructive forces held against us. We have always been able to tap into the great omniscient dimension. Some of us call it God. And we've been able to create solutions to cope. Now, again, that being said, many of the panelists have, have, you know, have reminded us that you can't just do it on your own and, oh, okay, it'll be all right, and, and I'm too tough, and I got it. Well, you know, no. I mean, the bottom line is science is science. Data is data, right? But at the same time, 
we have this unique ability to create. We can create Ubuntu. So through opportunities, we come together, we circle up and we share stories, we share information. My brother, Mauro, I really appreciate that story. That really hit me right here. It was personal and it makes me really think and reflect, right? It really does. And so these stories are powerful. You, are, you don't have to be on TV and YouTube and likes and things of that nature. No, you have value. And we have value. Ubuntu. I am because I am because of other people. We recognize this connection. And so my suggestion is by us realizing the power of who we are and staying connected to one another, I believe we can do this because our ancestors did this. My God, for 400 years, you have done everything in your power to destroy us. You have done everything in your power to destroy us. But still, we wake up with what? With joy in the morning. And if you felt that, that's the power of our people. I'm open to questions. God bless. All right. Thank you so much for that, Dr. G. That was a powerful lead into the question and answer period. So uh, we are very excited to be able to bring some of your questions to the table um, and talk through a lot of what we've learned tonight. Um, Dr. G, we're actually going to start with you with a couple of questions that came from the, uh, the Tuskegee study portion. Um, one of the first questions was to just talk about the collusion between black nurses and doctors keeping the study going after penicillin was already discovered in 1945. So what was um, some of what was going on behind that and why did it continue from that period on? Excellent question. What this question does is exposes the layers of systemic oppression. And so uh, on one level in retrospect, and we look back and we're like, shame, shame, shame. How can Tuskegee be affiliated with this? How can any black doctor be affiliated with this, this, that, and the third? Well, I don't know. Maybe 50 years from now, some people can ask birds for a point of trust who are affiliated with institutions. I mean, I mean, it's hard to jump in the pool and not get wet. And so those people at that time were doing maybe perhaps, you know, they were just focusing on their, their little thing, right? Okay, well, if I do what I have to do, you know, maybe somehow. Because remember, you know, in their defense, everything was a constructed lie, right? We're giving you placebos, you know, you're believing that you're getting better, but willfully, ethically, we are lying to you. So, so it, it was all constructed upon, I mean, I mean, think about, and again, I guess, to be fair, when you look at the Milgram experiment, you know, that was done over at Yale, you know, testing, you know, uh, will people trust authority? Uh, that was whites on whites, you know, and it was cruel, and, and, and you know, and, and you know, uh, we had to put in, you know, procedures, you know, to prevent people, you know, testing people to the limits like this. But especially in our case, where, uh, as, as Jones and other had mentioned, vulnerable population, you know, poor, uh, we have rights in theory, but we didn't have the means to exercise those rights or defend them. Then, no, this is it. And when you look at, you know, um, uh, what was his name? The, the gynecology, Dr. Sims, they had him up in New York and things of that nature, similar situation where he's testing, you know, these gynecological procedures, you know, on black women, you know, where they were live during the procedures and didn't have anesthesia, things of that nature. So what I'm su suggesting is that it's part of a larger convoluted system, right, where many people might be complicit without even realizing to what extent that they were complicit. And I think, you know, when we talk about this, the, the last thing I'll say, you know, because I'm sure others want to chime in, is that um, when I talk about how this was a lie and how pernicious and dare evil it was. Think about how it stopped. What, what, what did Jones say? Well, at least on the side, it said, it wasn't white, white man was tossing and turning in his bed and he was like, oh, you know what? Oh, th th this is wrong. It's been going on for too long. Uh, it's been 40 something years. Let me stop. No, it was an expose. So only when forced and embarrassed where, where, where was it a matter of, okay, now I'll stop. And so I think it just begs us to think about what we're doing right now, right? Because think about it, especially in the aftermath of George Floyd, rest in peace, if he can, goddamn, horrible, eight minutes, 46 seconds. That was horrible. What I'm saying is that, wait a minute. So all of a sudden, you know, all, all of a sudden, Airbnb, Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, Nike, Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, Lando, Lando Lakes, uh, Anjumama, Black Lives Matter. Okay, well, what about... 
January of this year. Okay, okay, so Black Lives Matter in June. What happened to June? What, what happened to January this year? Right? I mean, so what I'm saying is we, we can't fall for the hook. The same corporations who are selling us this nonsense in January, all of a sudden they see and now Black Lives Matter in June. Well, okay, what about uh, August? And what about uh, September? And uh, what about October? And what about, you know, two years from now, five years from now? years from now i mean remember uh the syphilis experiment was exposed five years after the 1964 civil rights act was signed i mean think about it think about it don't for real and i'll and, 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 you know listen to anybody else but what was more revolutionary than dr king looking over lyndon b johnson signing the civil right what was more revolutionary than that and 50 some years later, we see that a white man can smirk with his hands in his pockets while sitting on somebody's neck. I mean, so what I'm saying is just because we had Obama in a high place, black face in a high place, that didn't change the system. Black Lives Matter started on his watch. Thank you so much. Uh, we had another question regarding the question of trust um, and how things like the Tuskegee study led to that issue of trust within the black community when it comes to uh, medicine and uh, the medical field. Uh, the question that was asked was, isn't it unethical to take 23andMe gene samples when those samples can be taken by federal law enforcement without consent? There was also the question of um, if tissue samples were taken during unethical experimentation, why weren't those samples returned to the families or descendants or the royalties provided to a reparations fund? So I just want to touch quickly on that question of trust. Um, on what some of the failings have been and maybe what some of the moving forward actions can be uh, within the different areas of, of health that uh, we have represented here, whether it's physical health, dental health, uh, behavioral and mental health, what, what areas of mistrust have been built and what can we do to move forward um, beyond those, those things? I, I was glad to see um, Amber talk in her presentation about informed consent uh, stemming from the Tuskegee experiment. Uh, the field of psychology has a pretty notorious history um, when it comes to the mistreatment of the individuals that we study, specifically the Black community. Um, and I think where it starts is transparency and in an acknowledgement of our transgressions as professionals in the field. Um, you know, when, when you as a patient are walking into a doctor's office, a counselor's office, a dentist's office, and they can't acknowledge that the reasons that you are afraid to be there in the first place are valid because of the historical context. They can't acknowledge where their fields used to be to now it breeds a lot more distrust because it almost creates a sense of gaslighting, right? If we can't talk about the sins of our past in our field, then it, it, it's as if we're pretending they don't exist. And so we're not starting from a platform of trust to begin with. So like steps like informed consent are great, steps that, that breed transparency are great, but I think it, it goes more into having honest conversations as professionals of how we've made those mistakes in the past and acknowledging the hurt that they've brought about people, right? Do we learn about the Tuskegee experiment in high school, right? Or do you have to take an elective to learn about that? Do you have to stumble upon a website to learn about that, right? Why aren't these mistakes more in the open? If they were in the open, perhaps it could breed more of an open dialogue so we can start that journey of trust. But until we acknowledge our faults in a really public way, I, I don't think that we can build that trust. Thank you. Dr. Moore or Dr. Green, did you have any thoughts to add on that? Well, I just wanted to comment. I don't come from a research background, but I know when uh, the little bit of research I have done as a medical student and as a, a medical resident, you know, we had to go through a, an institutional review board. And now we have medical ethics departments. So you have to, you, know, you really have to uh, demonstrate that what you're doing is ethically um, ethically is ethical now. 
You know, you can't just willy nilly, you know, drag people in, do procedures on them without their consent. And you have to make sure that they understand what you're doing and the consequences of what you're doing. So I think there are a system of checks and balances that are that have been put in now as a result of that study. But still, you know, we have a lot of black people that still don't trust the medical system and rightfully so. I mean, transgressions have been done, but um, especially more so with the older population. I know I did some sickle cell research and just trying to enroll, especially your older black people in those in those uh, studies. It can be difficult because you do have that distrust. And then you have healthcare professionals that have inherent biases. You know, as as uh, as recent as uh, I think I think it was 2000. Wait, this this the last 10 years, people still understood that black people had thick skin. Black people, you know, could tolerate more pain. So we were when women were under medicated when it came to pain. We, you know, our our symptoms are brushed off we don't get the medical attention that we need to. So, you know, we still have, we still have a while to go. We have to acknowledge that there is a definite bias and racism involved in medicine. Thank you, Dr. Green. I believe it starts with more African-American providers, such as dentists, physicians, psychiatrists, to deal with the mental health issue, to understand the cultural piece that comes along with being black and dealing with all the stress in addition to racism on a daily basis, the microaggressions, the macroaggressions, the implicit bias and the explicit bias. And I also feel that cultural competence is key, but you will never be culturally competent no matter how much training you have. Cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, cultural humility on behalf of non-black providers is definitely key. But more importantly, we need to be the change we want to see. So if you want to see more black doctors, encourage young folks to go into medicine, encourage young folks to go into dentistry, to go into psychiatry, because the only way that we're going to change the dynamic to change that narrative is to make sure that we can tell our own story from our own perspective and treat our own patients. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Green, one of the questions that also came up was just uh, regarding the number of black doctors and health professionals. Um, do you have information on what percentage are graduates from uh, HBCUs? Um, the statement was made, we think desegregation would increase access for black professionals, but is the majority still graduated by HBCUs? I think unfortunately, a lot of the HBCUs are in financial trouble. The uh, graduating classes are becoming smaller. And, and uh, this, you know, let's face it, it's expensive to go to med school. These residents are coming out of med school owing $250,000 in debt. So uh, it, it's a tough proposition right now, but there was a slump in the last 20 years or so in the number of physicians. But I think we're, now we're seeing an uptick in blacks in medicine, which is, which is definitely a, a welcome thing to happen because the black physician poly, you know, population was getting older. We were aging out. And um, now more and more young people and especially a lot more women are going into medicine. So I think that I don't have exact numbers, but uh, I was looking at just looking at the chart in, pre in preparation for this for this uh, talk. And the numbers are starting to come up. Thank goodness. But we're still we're still very low in, in our overall numbers in regard to the black population. And we need many more black physicians, dentists, podiatrists pharmacists, you know, all, all along the spectrum, psychiatrists. I concur. On my research, I did a study in 2012, and at that time there were 95% white graduates of dental schools and dental hygiene schools. It has now been approximately eight, nine, 10 years later, and that number is down to 85%. It's not a lot. So on average, you have maybe 5% minority population graduating from dental schools and dental hygiene schools. And that's including all minorities. And that's just not blacks. So you're looking at 5% only. So I can do the dental numbers. I can't give you medical, but I can definitely give you dental numbers. And that number is, is low. Again, it is attributed to lack of finances. Many folks don't have the money to support, you know, $50,000 a semester for medical or dental school, even possibly more from the black communities. What can we do to change that? How can we change that? Do we offer more scholarships? 
such as Morehouse, Dr. G. Do we have the Morehouses and the HBCUs offering more scholarships for our underserved populations? That's what we need. They need support. But more importantly, when they get into those programs, they need to be able to be retained. You can recruit all you want to, but if not, unless you have a, re a retention program to help support them, they won't graduate. Because I see it in my program all the time. If you don't have support systems in place, some students don't know how to study, number one. Number two, they don't have that, that STEM background. Studies have shown that African-Americans have a low science, technology, engineering, and math background. And if they do have it, they get it in high school and into college. That's too late. It has to start in elementary schools to train them, to get their brains functioning towards going into the sciences. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Moore, actually, the next couple questions are for you from the audience. Uh, there was a viewer who asked, why are major dental procedures not covered by most insurances? Major dental procedures are not covered by insurance because <laughs> it has been for years, the dental uh, profession has not been closely monitored like the medical profession. Therefore, the dentist can set any fee they want and not have any type of governing body to mandate those fees. For example, you can go to a private practice in DC and he can charge, let's say $100 for cleaning. You go to PG County, he's charging $150. P DC and PG County are right next door to each other, okay? And the reason is because there's not a federal mandate watching over a watchdog type of company, making sure that these dentists don't overcharge patients. Typically, assurance will only pay a certain flat fee for anything. So, for example, if you decide you want to get your cleaning done, the cleaning could be 100 bucks. If the insurance is only paying $50 for whatever the reason, and who sets those rates? Big white men who sit behind desks, okay? They say, I'm only going to pay $50 for this particular cleaning. You have Aetna insurance. Now, you have to pay 50 bucks out of pocket because the the office is going to charge you $100. So you have to pay that difference. So the, mainly it's because there's no oversight of the dental profession like there is for medical. And because private practice dentists are in it for what? The almighty dollar, right? They don't care if they're going to milk you and charge you extra. And then they also take advantage of folks who are uneducated about dental procedures. They may tell you you need to have a crown and bridge work done. You don't know. You take their advice. Now you're in debt, $500, $600, $800 for a crown that you probably didn't even need. And that happens to us, unfortunately, as the black community because we're uneducated and we trust some of these white doctors because, oh, he's white. He must be telling me the truth. That's not the case. I've worked for black dentists. I work for white. And I've seen that black folks tend to not even support their black dentists. They will go into a black dental office and give the black dentist the hardest time. But when they go to the white office, they'll trust the white man like that. And it's sad, but it's true. And it happens all the time. We need to support our own. I think Dr. G alluded to it earlier. Ubuntu, we need to support our own. Thank you. Well, and the next question really goes into, uh, there were a lot of comments that were being made about the work that uh, you specifically are doing both within Flagstaff and specifically in uh, Washington, DC um, to try and advocate for changes. So the question was uh, a local question about dental care for the black community in Flagstaff. Uh, and the question was, what is being done currently to close the gap of disparity? And with that, there was also a question on your work specifically in Washington, DC to seek more support from politicians in the dental hygiene area. Have you seen any results in either of those areas? We have. So there is a coalition of black dentists called the National Dental Association and a coalition of black hygienists called the National Dental Hygienists Association. And we have joined forces. And when Diamante Driver died in 2007, we lobbied D.C. We went to D.C. We talked to congressmen and we wanted to make sure that that would never happen again to a black child. And so what, as a result, the Maryland local community came out with a mobile dental van. And that mobile dental van now goes around to PG County and DC area to do dental screenings on children to, to provide preventive care. And so that's happening all over the United States, not just in DC, but there's called the Children's Oral Health Coalition here in Arizona. And we also have the um, Colgate Bright Smiles, Bright Futures van that travels all over the United States in various schools to do exactly that, screenings, preventive care for children who are in underserved populations. And so the 
coalition of dentists and hygienists, we work together to try to reduce those disparities, to make, to make sure that these children are getting the much needed care that they so rightly deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Morrow and Mr. Berkeley, you both touched on some of the personal traumas um, and aspects of trauma in the Black community and the Black experience. Can you just briefly retouch on the topic of trauma as it relates to the visuals associated with much of what we're seeing these days? Uh, we have steady streams of the Black Lives Matter rallies. We have the showing and reshowing of brutality, harassment, and so forth, all paired with the current health crisis that the entire nation is facing. What are the important things for our audience to know about trauma-informed engagement with the Black lived experience? Well, I could touch on that first. Um, when it comes to trauma in our community, we're not very inviting to hear our fellow man express a weakness. Um, and if, if you can't talk to your own sibling or your own parent, cousin, aunt, uncle, you're a lot less likely to go speak to a professional about that trauma as well. So then it becomes unresolved and then you get coping, coping mechanisms that come out in violent actions typically. Um, so what we try and do to break down those barriers is again, um, align those individuals when they're willing to talk with somebody that is understanding. Um, there's no judgment in the mental health community. Um, we want to we wanna have open avenues of communication, live streams like this to let people know there are agencies that they can reach out to, um, even at uh, Mr. Barkley's company or any other health plan in, the, in Arizona, you can give them a call. Uh, let them know your zip code. They will get you in touch with the provider if you're in the underserved community. Um, if you're in the but, if otherwise, you can just you can give them a call and they will find you um, an outlet. Um, so I'll let Dr. Barkley talk on that. Uh, thank you, David. And and you know, there's two parts of that question that I think are really interesting. One talking about just the images of the times. I I think folks often underestimate. The, the power of imagery. So for instance, um, relating to the current pushes to just police brutality, right? When, when you think about trauma, so you, you see the blue uniform, you see a video of, of George Floyd or hear the account of Breonna Taylor, these, these heart-wrenching accounts that, that evoke fear, right? And then you step into the community and see like a Blue Lives Matter flag or a Blue Line flag, right? It, you can immediately go to this place of a fear and stress response. It, it, it evokes a lot of questions, right? Um, you know, am I in danger? Does my life matter less than the police lives that they're that they're um, representing and, and promoting? So even in so-called uh, supposedly innocent expressions of your political views, you can in turn be sending a message, whether you know it or not, of dog whistle terms of oppression and of hatred to, to evoke fear, whether you know it or not. Uh, so for our allies in the community, what, what I like to say is to give us space to express our emotions, right? I think historically there's been this stereotype of you don't want to be the angry black man, right? You don't want to be the angry black woman. You don't want to be the angry black man yelling about issues. But how could we not be angry, right? Our brother was just killed. Our sister was just killed. Someone died. How could we not be angry? Our community is experiencing disparities that people don't seem to understand. And so it's important to give people room to react how they're going to react in the Black community. Because uh, reactions of intense anger, sadness, depression, uh, physical responses to, to these uh, tragedies are the most natural responses we can have. Contrary to belief, we don't really get to pick the emotions we experience when something happens. What happens is our body, it sees the stimulus, and within a fraction of a fraction of a second, all of that is sent to our brain, and our brain tells us what we're feeling, right? And so if as a Black person, you are really angry and pissed off about what's going on, give yourself the space to be angry, right? Be gentle with yourself, allow yourself to feel these emotions and don't shame one another for feeling these emotions of sadness, of anger, maybe of being burned out. 
um, because we're constantly bombarded with a reminder of oppression in the news um, and when we step out into the community. Mm -hmm. Cara, I think you're muted. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, Amber, we had a question for you about um, just the work you're doing now and the importance of uh, research and engagement within the Black community and why some of the research that you're doing uh, and also just research in general is so important to keep us focused on um, some of that Black lived experience and, and making sure that we're breaking down some of the disparities that have existed. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so right now I'm on the sequencing team at TGen and we are sequencing the gen genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is the virus that causes um, COVID-19. So the importance of that is um, we're able to track, one, we're able to track how the virus is spreading. Um, how it's spreading through the community. We're able to look at how it's mutating. So we recently discovered that the strain in Arizona is a lot more contagious than some of the other strains going around the, the, um, the country and around the world. We can also see how it's traveling globally. Um, and then we're also able to see, so there's different communities that are handling, um, that are experiencing it differently. So some populations have really high death rates while others are not. So looking at the genome and um, kind of tracking down, we can hopefully see why that is, why, you know, maybe there's a genetic reason um, that some people are faring this a lot better than others, but we'll be able to, that's, that's, that's kind of the, the track that we're going with, um, sequencing all of those genomes. And it's 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 so important. I find I find um, biological research so incredibly important, especially with the emergence of personalized treatment. So my um, I'm really interested in cancer research, and so they're coming up with more and more complicated or not complicated, but more tech technical ways to address these cancer types because you know cancer is over 200 different types. So you have different cell types that can replicate and replicate and turn to cancer, but it's different for everybody. So understanding heredity. Um, and our, our, how, our, how our genes are affecting, affecting us are important because then we can tailor specific treatments um, that are more effective than my, what it might have been. And like I mentioned with pharmaceuticals, so there might be genes that cause us to react to um, a particular pharmaceutical differently than if it was given to somebody else of the same sex size, um, if that was all taken into account. But our, our genes are um, play, or altering that. So I... I think it's really important to break down um, those barriers because we need that data. We need data from all of these different populations in order to have a better idea of how to how do we treat those diseases? How do we understand um, spread of diseases within a community or why one community is doing better than the other? Um, that goes kind of more internally, or that, that's not what I'm trying to say. Um, to take into account the genetic disposition for certain things on top of understanding those social social determinants for health disparities. But I think understanding, have, having that data from um, minority populations, I think is a key to help helping understand those health disparities. Thank you so much. And finally, just one last question for all of our panelists, um, because I think we've started touching on it in, in different ways throughout this presentation. Uh, there's a quote from James Baldwin that basically says, to be black and conscious in America is to be in a constant state of rage, um, or an, a nearly constant state of rage. He also speaks about how to channel that rage uh, and that consciousness. So I think an important question for us to touch on is just what are important things that we as a community can do and those of us who have engaged in this conversation uh, tonight, including our audience, can do to channel our new knowledge of the Black lived experience in terms of health into action. And that's for anyone. <laughs> well. I can say for one thing, I have, since I've recently retired, I've turned my rage into, into political action. And so uh, we're trying to form uh, a community of black 
uh, people that are that are you know politically aware. We're trying to uh, try to we're trying to push a certain agenda and make people aware that you know we need to stick together. You know, unity like the Uhuru unity brings power. There's power in numbers. So that's how I I've channeled I channeled my rage or anger. You know, you've got to compartmentalize things and turn turn the negative into a positive. I've been focusing my rage on community, reaching out, finding finding those people who, like me, really suffered um, for a while being alone and dealing with anxiety and depression. And so really reaching out and trying to form the community that I so desperately wanted. Um, reaching out with like the American or African American Advisory Council and doing postpartum support help for others. So understanding that other people are suffering through similar things than I am and that I can reach out because I've, I've survived. I can reach out and then support others going through similar, similar things. Um, I've realized that this fight is going to transcend me the same way it transcended my parents and my grandparents. Um, I, I, I worked in a corporate America for quite a while. Um, and I realized that that was like a, it was like a rat wheel for me. Uh, I started these businesses. I have five kids. They they hear about the things that are going on in the community. They ask me questions. I'm very transparent with them. And my goal is to create this legacy that I can leave to my children and this knowledge that I can leave with my children so they can spread that throughout the community, um, whether it be running the businesses that I start or starting their own businesses. So that, that's just my, my focus on social action, trying to hire within the community, serve the community the best I can. So that's that's kind of my focus. Yeah, and on, on two fronts, you know, from, from my perspective, I think first and foremost, we can hold one another accountable. Uh, it's not comfortable and it's not fun, but neither is racism, right? Neither is institutionalized oppression, right? And so I think each of us has a personal responsibility to hold our loved ones accountable with the way they approach their day-to-day -day lives, their language, to hold our professional colleagues accountable when we notice implicit bias in our professions, when we notice discrimination within professions, and to hold our community members accountable um, when they are doing things that don't serve the mission of promoting equity for our community. And then secondly, I, I think it's it's by towing the line between not burning out because you're no, you're no use to the movement if you're burned out and you're completely over it, but also not losing that fire, right? Not losing that anger because there's so much going on. Sometimes people get tired of hearing it, your friends, why are you always talking about these issues? Why are you always being so negative? But it's because you care. It's because you have a big heart. It's because you love your neighbor. And so not losing that fire, but towing the line between taking care of yourself so you don't burn out but remembering that we're in this fight, that it's a fight um, and that it's gonna go on for a long while. So you've got to keep that passion about you. I'm gonna go, cause I know Dr. G is gonna go last and, and give us some words of wisdom, something profound. So I think it's more important for us to keep everything in mind that you guys just said, but also to educate, you know, educate each other, educate our children, educate our students. I'm here, I'm the only African-American in this department and I serve as that beacon for and mentor for students of color, not only black students, but any student of color. And they see me and say, you know what? I can do this. I can do dental hygiene. I can be an educator. I can do this. I can do that. And so I alluded to it earlier, be the change you want to see. But at the same time, I agree with Mr. Barkley. We need to hold each other accountable. We also need to educate our children about wealth, about real estate, about investments, about owning their own black businesses. But as an educator in an institution, PWI, predominantly white institution, I mentor my students. I give them that confidence. I make sure that they have that support systems that they need to get through, the, through these uh, difficult times. You know, this is a very difficult program, dental hygiene. And so I'm doing my own little thing in the corner of my world, but at the same time, we all can, you know, encompass those different concepts and be, you know, that that support system, that beacon of light, that mentor, that big brother, that big sister for students, children of color who are coming up and they look at us for direction. I think that's very important. And I know Dr. G is going to leave us with something profound. So I'm going to 
sign off. Thank you. Well, Dr. Moore, I appreciate Divine. And so it has been indeed been Divine sharing this space with you all in terms of being able to soak in all this information and knowledge. And so uh, in conclusion, I, I just have a little ABCs as far as you know, what can we do as far as how to move forward. Uh, the A would be acknowledge, right? So when Barkley and others are talking about anger, last time I checked, anger is a natural human emotion. And so there should be no shame in that many of us, particularly in middle-class environments, you know, i.e. predominantly white institutions where we're surrounded by white folks, you know, we are kind of restrict ourselves. This idea, okay, well, if I do emote, if I do actually express myself, then I'm going to be the angry black woman. I'm going to be the angry black man. And we know the consequences of, they will call the cops. I mean, we've seen all the Beckys and the Karens. You know, I mean, you saw the Amy Cooper situation at the park where a girlfriend violated the law. And then the minute he says something about it, now she wants to call, you know, and get all upset. And so, you know, so we, we make these connections and so we restrict ourselves. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that um, anger is a natural human emotion. See, part of the problem is I have too many white friends, right? See, they tell me their stories, right? See, I watch them, I observe them. I go to the airport, you know, I want to see the manager. You know, this is an affront. You know, I'm upset here, right? You know, so this is okay for them to be upset. It's okay for them to emote themselves. And I do it. I'm going to restrict myself. No. I think we're acknowledging our own humanity by saying that, you know what, I'm angry. And guess what? If anything, it's appropriate. If anything, you should be angry about certain things, right? You saw the beautiful baby that, that Jones had for, just flashed in and out. I don't know where the baby went. But the idea is that if, if somebody came and like slapped the baby, Miss Jones, are you gonna laugh? You know, you know, are you gonna laugh? No, you're going to be upset and you should be upset as a mother. You should. That shit is wrong. It should not happen. And see, that's the problem, right? Just real quick. Um, I've had the, I guess, misfortune of going to Auschwitz. I've seen with my own eyes. I've seen with my own eyes the concentration camps. I'm not Jewish. But the fact of the matter is I'm human. Duh. Duh. Did it happen? I can relate. I'm angry over that. And see, what I'm saying is so many of our white brothers and sisters I, I, you know, we, we have to we have to work to remind them about their own humanity. It's not just our own black thing. No, you're a human being too. I mean, no. Again, what? Who among us cannot look at that footage, right? Eight minutes and forty six seconds, and I, and I say that should not have happened. It's basic. It's human. We should be angry about this. There's no shame in that. Be believe. Um, if seeing is believing, then. We need to uh, be a little bit more uh, strategic and intentional about policing what it is that we're seeing, right? Personal story, right? I'm gonna follow morals with the personal story track. Um, you know, we sitting here in the COVID situation, you know, our, our, you know, our schedules got changed. So we had this little lunch routine, right? As y'all see, I'm keeping it real in the, in, in the garage, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, that's, that's an effect of COVID, you know what I'm saying? So excuse the background, right? But yes, I got, got fans on, that's why my hair is flowing, okay. But bottom line is, COVID situation threw a wreck, a wrench in everything, see what I'm saying? So 12.30 every day, we watching, uh, what's it called Law and Order Special Victims Unit? Okay, no worries. But the fact of the matter is, is that again, I don't know if y'all watch the show, if y'all y'all fans. It's been on for 19 years. Mercy got Hargitay and all this that and third. If and when there was a brother or sister on TV, it was a problem. It, it was a problem. Right. It was a problem. Right. You know, when, when it was a white victim, like oh, you know, the music violins close up. You know, like oh, we can. And there's a story. Meanwhile, with that, no, I, I've seen where the judge was chastising. You know, the, the sister, she was like, she was a bit like, what are you talking? You know, you know, black women getting slapped and hit. So what I'm saying, you know, so what we said is like, why are we doing this? Why are we tuning in? I'm not paying for the privilege to poison myself. No, we're not having it. We're, so we, we we decided to change our habit and routine. We're not going to absorb that. Like, I mean, we talk about trauma, well, what moral, uh, Barkley talking talk about trauma. No, no, we're not absorbing that. That's your false image and I reject it. Hey, hey, someone, someone mentioned Baldwin. He said, I'm not the N-word, baby. I give it to you back. That's your problem. I, I reject that image. So if seeing is believing, this is where we can reinforce one another what I was saying about Ubuntu in terms of reflecting the very best to one another. Listen, I know humans and humans and she gets in your nerves and he gets in your nerves, but maybe with us, we go the extra mile. For many of us who so-called Christians, right? Maybe this is where we get a chance to practice that, right? Turn, especially when it comes to us and people, right? Now again, 
Nonsense is nonsense, you know, rules are rules. But the fact of the matter is, is that we have mercy and grace, especially when it comes to us, right? And lastly, see construction. Um, I'm interested in this idea of how we can construct new memories. All these people running all around, come on, take down that statue, take down that statue. Well, okay, that's all well and good. But what about the conversation about what statues are we going to build to remember a future legacy? We, 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 we're busy talking about what, what they did in the past. United Dollars, they got the act together. They raised up all this money, infiltrated the school systems, they erected over 400 monuments all across the country. Because, you know, that's what they believe. So, okay, so what are we going to do? I mean, I think these are the, the hard questions that we can start asking as far as how can we construct memory? How can we construct legacy? We have all this money flowing through the black community, but it seems to go through this revolving door out of our own community. And so how can we be more intentional and strategic about constructing our own memories so we can honor the first black chair of the dental program, it isn't Dr. Moore, right? Or we can honor our first black mayor of Flagstaff or in the state of Arizona as in uh, Coral Evans, right? We, 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 can, we can do this because obviously they're not gonna do it for us. If you go to the library, most of the books written about us are not written by us. So what I'm saying is part of people in closing that um, we must be vigilant in battling this impoverished mindset. See, the poverty you know, affects us in so many ways and you all heard the science behind how physically Right, there's these manifestations, right? All due because of the fear. I, I didn't have the health care. I didn't have it. But also, our mindset that we must strive to battle. Remember, power of Mbutu. I am who I am because of another person. There is no limit to our creativity, right? And so we're not interested in superficial, but substantive, social, and soulful changes. God bless. Amen. We went uh, over, but uh, it's all good. We thank you, all of you beautiful panelists tonight, brothers and sisters, um, how beautiful it is for brethren to be able to come to dwell together in unity. And truly, that is what we've done this evening. We thank you, Sister Kara, for facilitating this wonderful um, discussion tonight. We have focused on the Tuskegee experiment and the state of Black health care here in America. And as I listened to all of you uh, panelists this evening, the one question that kept going through my dome was how I got over. How did we get over? But Dr. G mentioned it through mercy and grace. When we look to the Quran, it says, and when I am sick, it is he who cares and who cures me. When I go into the biblical scriptures, I see that by his stripes, we are healed. And then when I go to the book of James in that same biblical book, Holy Scriptures, faith without works is dead. And so we need uh, more black doctors. We need more black clinicians, more black uh, medical researchers, mental health care providers, counselors, psychologists, um, and if our brothers and sisters of the European American race are asking what is it that they can do, well, as we take our seat at the table this evening, uh, we're asking for more cultural sensitivity, more cultural competency, more cultural humility, and more cultural awareness. With that, we thank you for joining us this evening. We are taking our place at the table, and this evening we have dined marvelously. 
Uh, please tune in. Sunday is a special broadcast on tone policing. Um, community, you do not want to miss that conversation. And then we'll be back on Wednesday um, with a discussion on the two M's, Martin and Malcolm. Thank you so much. Thank you all. God bless. Have a good evening.